Hello, Richard. How are you? Very well, you? Yes, yes. Thanks for joining me on this conversation. Um, These are unprecedented times and they're very confusing to all of us, really. And Mm. um, I thought it'd be useful if I could maybe put some questions to you that have come to me from the public who have concerns and also some of the the questions and concerns I have as well. So um, if you're okay with that, we'll we'll proceed. Good, good. So... First question is, um, what is Cleveland Police's approach to tackling the virus and upholding the social distancing rules that exist? So it's national guidance. Obviously, we start with engagement and then we work with encouragement and education and then move to enforcement. So it's a national approach set down by the National Police Chiefs Council and obviously by government generally. That's part in terms of the guidance that we have to enforce that legislation. What I will say is that the vast majority of people on Teesside and in Cleveland specifically are adhering to the guidance. We're seeing much better compliance than we did in the early days. Um, and of course, we try to engage wherever we possibly can. And that's what the vast majority of engagements that we do have is just about talking to members of the public, because we do need to make sure that we have a relationship with them way beyond this crisis that endures beyond COVID-19, because COVID-19 will pass. And that relationship with the public is vitally important. What we can do if we need to, of course, is to jump to uh, enforce. Uh, and if we see people repeat offending uh, or uh, in large groups, then we can do that. But we do tend to start at the lower end and making sure that we graduate up to that, which is, I think, been well received across the area. Good, good. So how are you communicating this approach to the, to the different and diverse communities that we've got in the Cleveland area? Well, a number of different ways. Um, The push in recent years, of course, has been onto digital platforms and social media, and that's a fantastic way of getting a message out quickly. We're doing that today, and it works really well. But we do need to understand, of course, that not everybody, for example, has access to the internet. Not everybody has English as a first language. And so we have to make sure that the messages that we deliver are in a number of different formats. So yes, we do the digital outreach, but there are more traditional ways as well. And that is contact, social distancing, obviously, but contact with members of the public, and making sure there's material available to them in their language of choice uh, and again educating and informing and engaging with our public so across a number of different means but of course it's not just Cleveland Police that are doing this this is not a policing first response this is a social response to what is a global health pandemic and so we don't do this on our own a number of different agencies um, ensure that they push out the same types of guidance and reach those hard to reach communities. And we've got an engagement team that are out every single day, making sure that they do that with our neighbor policing teams. Good, good. Is the approach the same across the whole of the Cleveland area, would you say? And how how will you deal with um, what we call hotspots? I'm conscious that uh, we're about to hit the Easter weekend, which by all accounts is likely to be quite a challenging one in, in, in that respect. How will you How will you approach that? Well, I hope it's not a challenging uh, time for the weekend. It could be, but we hope that most people, if not all people, adhere to the guidance that have been pushed out. In terms of making sure that the response is the same across the four local authority areas that we have, then we have a daily meeting. You and I meet every day uh, and scrutiny happens in that forum. We have a silver level meeting, a gold level meeting and regional meetings as well. So there's a whole host of different um, stop gaps, I suppose, in that system to make sure that we are adhering to the guidance that we've been uh, provided with. Um, and we ensure that we report every day on the numbers of warnings and tickets that are issued, but also we capture the amount of engagement you do with members of the public. And the enforcement part is a tiny part of what we do. It's an important part of what we do, but it is a tiny part. You mentioned the bank holiday weekend. Of course, the weather looks like it's going to be really good today and for the course of the bank holiday weekend as well. So part of the approach that we're going to take is to make sure we proactively patrol some of our beauty spots. We have some stunning coastline here in Cleveland and some inland areas which are just as beautiful. And it's important that we are there proactively to ensure that the public are engaged with. And again, if required, we can move through to enforcement. But we are proactively out making sure that those areas are policed. Not because we want to have to do this, Nobody wants to have to do this, but by adhering to the guidance, community members in Cleveland or visitors to Cleveland can help save lives. So it's important that we are proactive about this with our partners. 
Good, good. I was in a conversation earlier this week with the policing minister. We have a weekly dial-in where we update nationally and obviously locally. And he yep. said um, 99% of the public are, um, are being responsible and are, and are, um, are doing the right thing. And that must be obviously of great support to your officers. And they are very supportive of your officers. And this is a real... Um, different challenge for all of us and you're um, very much at the centre of this in in terms of your wider role and I wonder could you just tell tell us all a little bit more about the wider role that you've got in this? Yeah of course so I chaired the strategic coordinating group and that is a group of all of the key partners virtually sat on the table we can't do that because of social distancing measures of course but that is local authority representatives, NHS, uh, North East Ambulance Service, the coroner, police, fire, utility companies, you name it, we are sat around that virtual table discussing how we approach um, the issue of the pandemic here in the Cleveland area. So my role is to chair that meeting and to coordinate the response to make sure that we are getting all the PPE that's required, personal protective equipment, um, and that all of the different challenges for all the different agencies are fed in with each other so that we all are able to care for each other across those four areas. So I do that for the Cleveland area, but more recently as well, I, I have also chaired the regional strategic coordinating group, and that is on behalf of the Northeast. So that is, in terms of the Northeast, in terms of to, to draw a line as to where that is for the purposes of that meeting, the strategic coordinating group for the Northeast is the Cleveland area. Uh, it is for the County Durham and Darlington area and the Northumbria area as well. And so all of those areas dial in every single day, and it's today bank holiday. We will be dialing in today. Mm -hmm and coordinating the response across the northeast because whilst the response might be slightly different in those different areas it has to be some degree of joint ownership and corporacy to make sure that people get the same service no matter where they live we don't want it to be a postcode lottery so we make sure that the same service is delivered across the area if we can and so my role is very much outward looking coordinating the uh, services that deal with this pandemic and of course the nhs are foremost in that fight Good, good. Um, I, I've always thought that partnership working in, in Cleveland second to none, and I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if you're happy about the involvement of all the other agencies and their contribution. I get the impression that everybody's pulling together and pulling really hard. Is that is that the case? Absolutely. Um, there's a saying I've seen, I think, online a few times that not all heroes wear capes. Um, it's incredible the level of commitment that we've seen amongst partners and the police service here in Cleveland over the course of this pandemic. We're into week yeah. three now, I think, of lockdown soon. Every yeah. single day, and it is every single day that strategic coordinating group happens locally and regionally, it's the same people that dial in. Their commitment yeah. to their area and the communities. Yeah. And these are things that our communities will never see. They will never see the level of administration and coordination that sits behind what they see in the front line. I'm blown away by the response of our partners um, to what has been a, an unprecedented event in certainly my in my lifetime. Yeah, good, good. Thanks. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions now that have come in from members of the public through my scrutiny process. You know, we we engage on a regular basis, but it's really important for me that um, I'm able to put their questions. So the first yes. one's about police powers. Mm -hmm. um, how are the course, ensuring that the coronavirus powers are used with common sense? Um, will they be used consistently? And how long will they last? Well, the issue of how long they will last is a matter for government. Uh, obviously, they set the law um, and it is up to us to engage with those laws as and when we need to. So how long will it last is a matter for government. Um, in terms of how we scrutinise that work, well, I'll refer to some of the things I said in my earlier answer. There is a daily meeting where we ensure that those uh, um, enforcements, if we get that far, are done properly and there's a degree of consistency. And internally, therefore, I and, and Lisa Orchard, one of the assistant chief constables, is the gold commander for the police service, make sure that internal messages are delivered consistently. This is what we expect to see from police officers. This is what we expect to see from uh, our members of staff as well, because it's not just police officers we have on the front line, of course. We have members of staff doing precisely the same uh, type of work. And so the consistency comes from daily feedback and making sure that we provide more information where it's required for our staff members. Over and above that, of course, you have a scrutiny process. Already we've had uh, one scrutiny process where you have asked some relevant questions around uh, the law and the enforcement of that law. 
And so there's a whole host of different ways that we do that. So um, it's a daily process. It's an iterative one. I think, it is my humble opinion only, but I think in Cleveland we have struck the right balance in that regard and it's worked well. I think we still got our communities on board um, and, and that's really pleasing to see. The amount of support that we get on that on social uh, media channels has been incredible. So I think we've pitched it properly, but that's something we continue to look at. Yeah, good, thanks. The next question I'm going to ask is about, about shop workers and supermarkets and I think yeah. we both have the view that they are, they are frontline workers, they're keeping everybody fed. Um, yeah, they are. People are worried about, about shop workers. How will we protect them? How will the police protect them from aggressive shoppers? And how will we try and uh, ensure that social distancing is being enforced in supermarkets where that's, where that's needed? Well, wherever we can, we stay out of supermarkets. I think it's important that we do that. Um, supermarkets are almost semi-private places, things where you go and buy things which you need for your home address. It's not for the police service to get involved in that area. Mm. And what, I, what I'm pleased to see as a shopper, not as a police officer, is that when I go to the supermarkets that I shop in, and I've shopped in a few since uh, this crisis has happened, that the supermarkets have done a great job for themselves in ensuring the social distancing guidelines are met. You can't in, enter lots of supermarkets and smaller shops until, for example, you've cleaned your hands. There are reminders that you must stay wherever possible two metres apart. And so that's not something that we get involved in necessarily. Of course, when a level of violence is offered to shop workers and uh, anybody working in that sector, it's incumbent on the police service to get involved or in large groups that simply can't be moved on by shop workers. And we've done that. We've arrested people for shoplifting. They've gone on to, for example, coughing people's faces, shop workers and emergency workers. And when that happens, we arrest. Um, and we have seen across the country that the courts have taken a really dim view of people that do those types of things and have offered jail sentences. Yeah. And so... That is a tiny, tiny proportion of the work that we do. Uh, and it's worth recording my thanks to the shop workers and the heroic work that they do very much in the front line. And the fact that they have policed, uh, in the widest sense of that word, mm. those issues on social distancing for themselves. They're doing a great job. Good. Thank you. I would certainly endorse that. Um, so social distancing, the next the next area. Um, what happens if people break the rules on social distancing and can say, for instance, somebody go and visit the girlfriend or their boyfriend who lives in a separate house to them. These are the kind of issues that people are wondering about at the moment. What's your views on that? It's going to be a politician's response, I'm afraid, to this question, Barry. And I know that you're the politician in this relationship that we have. It is not for me to offer advice on single particular examples. And there's a really good reason for that. It's not because I don't want to answer the question. It's because there is very, very clear government advice as to what you can and can't do. And if those rules are broken, we, we live, thankfully, in a democracy where we police by consent. And the police officers have a degree of discretion. So all of us will come to a marginally different view. Yes, we try to have consistency across the board, but it's very much dependent on the circumstances that prevail at the time that that person is stopped, if indeed they are stopped. And so it's important that I don't get involved in the well. This is possible, but you can't do this. Because if I start that debate and endorsing certain types of behaviours, others will use mm -hmm. it as an example to say, well, that was OK. Is this OK? And before I know yeah. it, on social media and in other forums, I'm getting into an hourly debate as to what people can and can't do. Yeah. That's the role of the police service. We have to remain out of people's private lives as much as we can and only intervene when we absolutely have to. So I would encourage anybody to look at the advice on government.uk, sorry, gov.uk, the government website, where I think it's as clear as it possibly can be as to what you can and can't do. Yeah, yeah good. I mean, I, I, I think we've got about 600,000 people who live in the Cleveland area. From what I can see of the figures so far, there's probably been about 200 occasions where you've had to intervene in some sort of enforcement type process, you know, whether it's fixed penalties or whether it's summonses or whatever. So that's, that's really interesting because that's a really small proportion of the wider population. And I think it just demonstrates to me that the public by and large are doing this right. You know, it's a very, yes. very small proportion who want yes. to or not. Um, yes, absolutely. The next question was was around um, police attending incidents. Um, how can officers respect social distancing when they're entering people's homes? Um, do they have the appropriate PPE and how do they know if anyone on the scene has got uh, symptoms? Mm. 
Well, we rely on our communities to tell us whether there's somebody within a home address that have symptoms. Um, during uh, the phone call, the original phone call on 101 or 999, here to the control room, we ask if there's somebody within the home address with COVID-related symptoms. So we do all we can up front to make sure our officers and staff are protected. Beyond that, obviously, they have personal protective equipment. The guidance relating to PPE changes on an almost daily basis because the scientific advice changes. And so sometimes you may see two police officers sat next to each other in the car wearing face masks. On the next day, you might not see them wearing face masks. So that is dependent on some of the guidance that we get. PPE, we do get access to PPE. Um, it, of course, we have to keep asking for more because we burn through it quickly, not as quickly as the NHS, for obvious reasons. They are very much in the front line of, uh, of this particular battle. But PPE is a daily requirement for our officers and staff. So social distancing, wherever we possibly can, we adhere to. The nature of police work means that the tiny proportion of interactions, and I genuinely mean tiny proportion of interactions that we have with the public, result in arrest. That sometimes yeah. means having to physically touch people and to place them in handcuffs. And social distancing mm -hmm. in those regards obviously can't be adhered to, but there are reasons for that. So it's up to police officers and police staff to wherever they can abide by those rules. Um, but obviously it isn't always possible given the nature of police work. Yeah, yeah thanks. Car travel. We've seen the numbers of cars on the roads are falling, which is great um, yep. under the circumstances. Um, for mental health purposes, why can't people jump in the car to go for a drive if they keep the windows and the doors closed? Um, why can't people drive to walk their dog or exercise uh, as long as they're social distance? I suppose that's the sort of view that's been expressed by some people. What's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, when we see the five o'clock briefings uh, from government, uh, whether it's the Prime Minister, and I'm delighted to hear that his health is improving, best wishes to him, of course, or whether it's Dominic Raab or anybody else, they always have the experts stood next to them. And there's a really good reason for that. They are able to answer the types of questions which you just put to me in terms of why can't we drive to places? My job as a police officer is to make sure that wherever we can, we engage with the law and the best minds, medical and scientific, that we have in this country. And our scientific and medical people in this country are amongst the best in the world. They tell us not to do that. And so all my job is to job is, is to make sure that police officers and police staff adhere to that guidance for themselves. Obviously, we have to be role models, but beyond that, enforce that where we have to. So in terms of why that is the case, I would push anybody in the direction of those scientific and, and medical advisors who, who can explain why. And again, some of that information is available on gov.uk. Uh, gov yeah. OK, thanks. Um, coming back to my, my own questions now, rule, rule breaking. How do they how do the public report rule breaking or concerns about people who aren't social distancing? So they do that in exactly the same way they'd report anything else to the police service. And uh, there's a couple of things worth mentioning. Though. First of all, in terms of what people report to the police service, things which are purely health related matters should go to the NHS website. And we push them deliberately on the request of the NHS to the website so that the phone lines uh, aren't entirely clogged all of the time. If you can't get what you need or aren't able to access the Internet, then it's dial uh, the NHS helpline. If it is a police related matter and only if it's a police related matter, and that can involve obviously informing us about whether it's a large party that's happening or people who aren't adhering to the rules, then they can call us or contact us in any of the ways that they would. They can stop a police officer in the street. Uh, or a police staff member is a PCSO, for example. They can phone 101, they can use our online platforms. Some people do actually still write letters to us. So any of those traditional means that people have contacted the police about other, if I can call them traditional crime-related matters or police incident-related matters, they can do the same for COVID-19. Yeah, good, good. OK, um, I want to ask about vulnerability. I think it's a concern of, of you and of, of me that um, we're worried about people who are, who are vulnerable in our society and we, we're doing our best to help them. Um, mm -hmm. If somebody's worried about a vulnerable person, uh, how would they raise this with the police? I'm thinking vulnerability in terms of domestic abuse or people who might be seen as victims of modern slavery, that kind of thing. How would you, how would you uh, address those concerns as, as a police service? Well, again, I would encourage people that see things that they're not comfortable with, whether that's domestic abuse in a neighbouring property, for example, or anything, frankly, I would encourage them to contact the police in all the same ways that they have previously done, 101, 999, online mm. platforms, etc. So please continue to report incidents to us. A proportion of our work is COVID-19 related, but the majority of our work is police-related work. 
we are still operating as a police service. It isn't a matter of any police service in the UK, and particularly not Cleveland Police, that have shut down all of their normal services to do with COVID-19. That isn't the case. So please continue to report policing incidents to us. We do need to hear. If it's difficult for you to report them to the police, then you can still use platforms such as Crime Stoppers. You can call and direct, or again, there's an online and anonymous platform on the internet as well. But we have some fantastic third sector agencies working in the Cleveland area as well. Specifically, you mentioned domestic abuse. There are some fantastic agencies out there helping. You can contact them directly if you have concerns about somebody. So it's in all the same ways that you have previously. People such as domestic abuse victims are currently potentially housed within the same home or address as their abusers, of course, and are unable to leave the home address. This can be a particularly acutely difficult time for them. So wherever they possibly can, I would encourage still that they contact the police service and we will do all that we can for you. The fact that COVID-19 is happening does not stop us doing our day job and we'd be delighted to help anybody who's in need. Yes, you're right to you're right to highlight the range of support services because they are fantastic. And we I commission a range of services and we've made sure in my office to, to make contact. I've spoken personally to all of them to make sure that they are OK as services, that they're able to function and that we'll give them whatever support they need. But mm -hmm. yes, they are an essential frontline service in in the same way as the emergency services are. Yes. Um, how are you working with the shielding hubs to to shield the most vulnerable people? I think the police have some input into that, don't they? Well, the shielding hubs are, um, just to explain to people who may be watching, are yeah. hubs, so one in each local authority area, where food and essential household items, for example, all come into one place, and then those that can't access those items for themselves because they're shielding for 12 weeks and perhaps don't have family or friends do those things for them, things can be distributed from those hubs. And so the work of the hubs is led incredibly well in the Cleveland area by the four local authorities. The work of the hubs is then um, overseen and coordinated through the tactical working group, uh, tactical coordinating group rather, and the strategic coordinating group that I mentioned earlier. So there is a degree of parity across those four areas and that any assistance yeah. from the central government is then provided. So it's been, um, it has been a logistical difficulty, you can imagine, across four local mm -hmm. authority areas but the work that those local authorities have done to deliver has been incredible. And again, it's a bank holiday. They will be out today doing exactly the same. Good, good. Yes, I'm pleased to hear that because my office has been helping as well, helping the support work uh, with those local authority hubs. And um, and I think it's it's a good another good example of everyone coming together, I think, to uh, to respond and, and unite uh, against this challenge. Um, the last question for me, Richard, is around uh, community tensions. How are the force handling community tensions and, and assessing them? Um, I'm concerned that, that the virus, um, and we've seen it, uh, I'll pick it up from my national briefings. It's a common problem. Uh, we've seen some individuals might seek to blame communities and, and, and um, attack them in some ways for, for the virus, which is wrong. Um, and I just want to you to give you the opportunity to reassure those communities that that's not the case. And also the work that you are doing across the Cleveland area in this respect. So tension is something that we monitor on a daily basis. There's a community tension return that we discuss every single day. And that's fed in by a number of things. Yes, from diverse groups, um, but also amongst people such as NHS workers, shop workers, who may be victims of crime at their places of work. And those things can raise tensions in communities during this crisis as well. So that is done every single day. What I will say for the Cleveland area is we've seen remarkably little tension. I think that speaks to the maturity of the people that we have living here. It speaks to the political leadership that we've had. And I'm delighted to say that despite problems emerging in other parts of the world and in other parts of this country, in Cleveland, everybody stepped up to the mark and we've seen a whole range of communities pull together so that we can get through this uh, in one piece and together. Good. Richard, I hope this is something we can repeat on a regular basis. And um, thank you for giving us the time and for having this conversation in the way that we're having it. And, and we hopefully will we'll use it as a way of raising awareness. Um, I'd also like to give my thanks to all our frontline officers and staff on behalf of the 600,000 people in the Cleveland area. The communities of Cleveland are right behind the police and all the other emergency services and public services in the way we're all pulling together to respond to this. So thank you all for that. Um, 
I'm really positive about the response that we've had. Um, I'm working hard with my office and partners to make sure we contribute to that. We'll continue the scrutiny process and I'll continue to, to take issues up on behalf of the public. Um, I think we've got a really good coordinated response. The biggest challenges may well yet to be yet to come, but if we all stick together and we all work together, I think we'll do really well. Good, thank you. Thank you.